Hello and uh, good afternoon to everyone. A very warm welcome to today's iCentity Connect. It's lovely to see everyone tuning in today. Um, and it's certainly been an exciting and busy time for neglected tropical diseases, um, uh, as very well summarized just recently at the World Health Organization's Global Partners Meeting, taking stock of the many advances and successes in understanding, controlling, monitoring neglected tropical diseases, but also mapping out all the many roads that lie ahead, uh, especially to those 2030 landmark goals set out by the very WH, that very WHO. Um, and uh, one of the things that really stood out from this meeting, or in fact this moment, which was chaired by a new director of NTDs, Dr. Sosefal, is this renewed momentum for global collaboration needed to address the remaining challenges in NTDs and whether this may, these may be in um, improving surveillance and diagnostics capacity as cases decline, ultimately informing programs, but conversely finding new treatments uh, for remaining cases and also more broadly capacity building in endemic areas, increasing that leadership and visibility of research and programs locally and many other goals. And so with this optic in mind and really delving into what is needed in concrete terms to translate those ambitious goals into reality, the timing uh, we felt was perfect to take a closer look at the role that biobanks in particular, which are collections of samples of tissues or specimens and health and biological information and data can really play in NTD research and development. And so with this in mind, it's my great pleasure to welcome today in collaboration with and on behalf of the Global Schistosomiasis Alliance, our three panelists for this session who will help us unpack the many opportunities that biobanks do offer to support and power that next stage in tackling NTDs. Um, so please do join me in welcoming without any further delay our three panelists. Uh, firstly, we will hear from Dr. Aidan Emery. Hello and welcome, Aidan. Hi. You are um, hi, research. Hi, hi, Aidan. Thanks for joining us. You're a research and laboratory manager and principal investigator at the Natural History Museum, and more specifically, lead of SCAN, Schistosomiasis Collection at the Natural History Museum in London, uh, which is a global repository of schistosomiasis related specimens and contextual data. So we look forward to your presentation. And then we will hand over to Dr. Sarah Nogaro and Warren Fransman. Welcome to both of you. Hi, um, Sarah, you are principal scientist uh, in neglected tropical diseases at FIND, um, the diagnostics um, PDP. And Warren Fransman, you are bio biobanking lead at FIND as well. So we really look forward to hearing uh, from your views and your experience. It's also a great pleasure to welcome everyone who's tuned in online. Uh, good afternoon, Edward D'Antonio from the University of South Carolina, Beaufort. Uh, Jennifer Giovanoli tuning in from Switzerland, University of Zurich. Jean-Jacques Mouyabi, bienvenue. Uh, vous nous joignez du Gabon um, and many others. And I'm sure, uh, please, you uh, feel free to take a moment Join the chat, tell us uh, where you're tuning in from, and also importantly, do uh, think of all your questions and your comments for our panelists. Uh, we will have time for a discussion and to answer all those questions after the presentations. So on that note, I will hand over to our first speaker, Aidan, the floor is yours. And thank you so much uh, for sharing your insights from the SCAN collection at NHM London. Thanks, Marianne, and, and thanks to David and Luke from the GSA for uh, for the invitation too. So I shall start by attempting to share my screen. So just bear with me a moment. Um, so hopefully you can now see the title slide. Um, Wonderful. So, yes, I'm going to be uh, talking about some of the schistosomiasis related material that we've generated uh, through research collaborations over the decades, actually, at the Natural History Museum, 
uh, but more specifically about a project that was funded by the Wellcome Trust under their biomedical resource grant scheme, and that's called SCAN, as Marianne said, SCAN, the Schistosomiasis Collections at the Natural History Museum. Um, and that was a, a, a project really that was funded anyway. Um, I hope I can show that it's still very much active, but it was funded by the, uh, by the Wellcome Trust uh, between 2011 and about 2021. So um, SCAN had its origins alongside SCORE, that was the Schistosomiasis Consortium for Operational Research and Evaluation. That was a program funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation via the University of Georgia Research, Research Foundation. And the reason that they were interested in a setting up in parallel uh, a biobank was that that program was likely to generate a lot of samples as it did via some population genetic studies that it was carrying out. So there's real value there to add, uh, sorry, there's a real opportunity there to add value by uh, retaining samples for additional research and then also to widen the scope by bringing in um, uh, samples that we'd already collected. As I said, we've been doing this for decades and also um, partner with other people as well. So to, to bring a lot of uh, material together uh, that, that could then be used for additional projects. Um, there were a lot of people involved in this uh, project. So I'm just going to mention the people at the bottom and, and maybe a, a, a couple of, of others get my some, some acknowledgements in early. So I was PI on the project, worked with Fiona Allen, who particularly led uh, the, the field work side of what we were doing, uh, Mural Raybone, who was uh, data and archiving. Uh, Toby Landeyu was with us for around two years, and that was with part funding from the SCI, um, now Unlimit Health. And then uh, David Rollinson also at the museum, uh, then now um, chairing uh, GSA, of course, and Dan, Dan Colley, who was heading up school. Uh, we had other people uh, involved in the project, employed on the project, for, uh, people like Chiha Ikebi and, and uh, John Archer. And so apologizing for not mentioning all of our partners, we were associated with so many projects. Um, so the idea was to form uh, partnerships and assist with projects that were collecting schistosomes so that the samples could then be archived and make available as a genetic resource uh, that could answer help answer wider questions about schistosome biology so the, the the idea was that we were not going to be a passive repository but we were going to actively go out and help people uh, to collect schistosomes in a way that was that would be of, of wider value um, and we were, and so the big question is why um, we were focused very much on um, on the parasite itself. These, this is not the human samples, you know, as a human sample bank for you know test, testing uh, diagnostics on or something like that. This was very much focused on the on the parasite and the snails themselves. And the reasons for doing this uh, can be illustrated by looking at the standard schistosome isolates say that that most research into schistosomiasis uses this data sheet on the right here is um is uh, relates to one of the standard isolates that the uh, that the schistosomiasis resource center in in the us provides and you can see from the description there which i've made larger on the left that this that schistosoma mansoni strain nmri was a lot isolated in the 1940s from um schistosome amounts on eggs obtained from Puerto Rican school children. So that means that these have been uh, isolated in the lab for in somewhere in the order of 80 years. If that's four pass, you know, if that's four generations a year, which it might well be, that's 320 generations, which is like having an isolated human population for eight and a half thousand years. Now, that's no criticism of, of, uh, of, of this way of operating. It's a very good idea to have inbred um, isolates. Uh, to, to do um, to do genetic and genomic and functional studies on to reduce the variability, uh, but there are certain questions that you can't answer using uh, using that kind of inbred material, and this was brought out really in this uh, this data on the bottom left here. This is from a paper by Gleichner et al. in 2014, and they pointed out that um, uh, look at Schistosoma mansoni here, for instance that for most of the published um, experiments and um, GenBank uh, DNA sequence entries, 
Uh, most of them were relying on laboratory stain, strains, which would be, you know, isolated from, from field populations for similar orders of magnitude to, uh, to, to the NMRI strain. Uh, and where they're not specified, that probably is also um, that is probably also a, a laboratory strain. So that's very likely also to be to be almost 100 percent. And they pointed out that, um, you know, again, that for for certain applications um, and, and they were focused on picking vac vaccine candidates, you really do need to have a better idea of the of the of the variation and population uh, genetics and genomics of what's going on out there in the field. Um, and that brings us on. So, so OK, we know what we we know what we want to collect, uh, but we don't know exactly what we want to collect because uh, uh, it's just the same as a complicated beast as we uh, as this audience, I'm sure, is is very aware of the the adult parasites live in the veins around the intestine around around the bladder. So uh, they're completely inaccess inaccessible. So that leaves taking stool or urine samples and collecting the eggs um, and, uh, and, 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 and processing those in some way or um, collecting snails and allowing the saccharial stage to emerge from, uh, from, from there and keeping those. We don't have any direct access to the, uh, uh, to, to the adult parasite itself um, unless we, we're um, talking about veterinary samples from abattoirs or, or something like that. Um, so the way that we always used to do this at the at the Natural History Museum would be to go into the field and either collect uh, stool urine samples, infect snails and bring them back to the lab and passage them through uh, a substitute definitive host, a mouse or a hamster. And that is the way, of course, that uh, the places like the Schistosmiasis Resource Centre or the um, um, uh, or the Theodore Billhart's Research Institute, you know, or you know, any anyone who's maintaining the life cycle, that's uh, including ourselves actually with uh, with the uh, with the London School now. That's how we would do that. Or you can collect the the snails and you know get into the life cycle back in the lab in the same way. And of course, that's very advantageous because we can um, it gives us access to all parts of the life cycle. It gives us access to live material, um, but it's very uh, expensive and very complicated. And actually. Um, in about 2010, it got too expensive and complicated for us to do. So we we were looking for other ways to capture that diversity from the field. Uh, interestingly, we are thinking about returning to this. We've got an, another project uh, that's Wellcome Trust funded going on at the moment called the Schistosome and Snail Resource. And um, at the moment, although we're only maintaining the laboratory, um, the standard a standard laboratory isolate of Schistosome and now we would like to expand that out to include other field related material and, and, and increase what's available in, in, uh, for, for, for research with live material. But that wasn't really a possibility for the SCORE project or for what we wanted to do with SCAN. So um, we had previously done some work along with uh, work that was led by John Webster's group, uh, then at Imperial College. Uh, to collect the larval stages, the Sakari and the and the Myricidia, and then um, just harvest those directly. So that involved the cleanup process. The basic process is here on the left. So we filter through, uh, put through a sort of uh, a, a crude filtration process, and then for the um, for the uh, Sakari or for, sorry for the Myricidia, for, for, you know, collecting the eggs, we would actually put those into a petri dish with fresh water and then allow those to hatch. So what you can see swimming around there and that it'll come around again in a minute is the uh, myricidial stage. And the, that's the great advantage of, of, of this system is that the, uh, the, the myricidia kind of clear, clean themselves up by swimming clear of any debris that you've, that you've co-purified. And so you, we can, take it through a second cleanup phase by pipetting into fresh water. Uh, this is sort of the, the, the dirtiest way of doing it. And of course, if we want to do this with Sakari, that's much easier. We can just um, put some snails in water and then collect the Sakari in exactly the same way. And then we're storing them on these FDA cards. That's um, 
a, a basically a piece of card that's chemically impregnated that uh, lyses the, uh, the these larval stages and then embeds the DNA within the matrix of the card and it keeps uh, everything stable at room temperature, which is, which is extremely useful when working in the field. There's no particular reason why it has to be FDA cards. You could use RNA later. You could use you know other fixatives, even ethanol. Um, but it, it just works. It works extremely well for us for transportation and for long-term storage. And of course, no cold chain. Uh, for collecting snails, we haven't found really a, a more practical way than collecting them and storing them and shipping them in, in ethanol. Just going back to that, I've realized from my notes, I, what I haven't mentioned from that is that um, initially that technique, you know, single myricidium or a single saccharia, we could just do a single PCR and get just get a, a small amount of uh, data based on part of a single gene. Uh, now we can, techniques have moved on sufficiently, we can get genome level data out of a single saccharia or myricidium. So that's, ex it, it makes it extremely versatile. And so over the 10 year for funding period, this is kind of the, the scope of the collection. So in the order of half a million schistosomes, that's not half a million from half a million different people. Of course, we collected quite a few schistosomes, you know, larval stages from each person or snail. That's mostly schistosoma mancini and uh, schistosoma, mancini, schistosoma hematobium, and mostly from Africa. Uh, and then again, an impressive number of, of, of snails um, compatible with, uh, you know, the, the, the compatible host snails, archive DNA extractions. And then we've got our previous samples as well. So we've got, you know, several thousand um, frozen adult schistosomes in liquid nitrogen as well. And those have been an extremely valuable source of material and very much in demand for genomic studies as well. Um, so having been through uh, essentially what we were doing and how we did it, um, we should think about you know, what are the outcomes. So uh, this is uh, a research focused uh, collection of material. So uh, sometimes the applications will be that people simply want access to uh, a species or uh, a strain or a location uh, that they couldn't easily otherwise get hold of. So for instance, for this comparative genomics paper where um, the this consortium um, just want ac wanted access to some of the species of schistosomes that people don't routinely keep in in the laboratory because it's what we used to do um, in those previous decades we had frozen worms and liquid nitrogen that, that we could supply to um, uh, for some of that work so so it enabled research that that, that they would have had a huge amount of problem sourcing uh, some of those species um, but really where it comes into its own, I think, is in um, is you can create studies that are beyond the scope of any individual project and give you give yourself a proper, con you know, cross continent, cross global reach. So this is quite an old paper now from uh, Bonnie Webster, uh, where we're looking at uh, the genetic diversity or actually the lack of genetic diversity for schistosoma hematobium that we all know uh, causes uh, urogenital schistosomiasis. Um, and, you know, the striking thing that we found, you know, by having access to samples right across Africa was that 80% of them actually had the same COX-1 mitochondrial haplotype, very, very low diversity indeed across the whole, the whole continent in, in real contrast with schistosoma mancini, which has a much more typical, um, sort of separation by distance, uh, kind of population structure. And then also the fact that the you know Zanzibar and the sort of Indian Ocean Islands and 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 the coast of East Africa there, there's a second type that's really very very distinct from the first type. So we've got we've got two separate you know very distinct populations of schistosoma hematobium, and of course that must have implications for you know for the um, the you know the, the genetic diversity of those parasites and what we might be able to predict and develop as far as things like um, uh, selection for um, vaccine candidates and all that kind of thing go. But I'm going to talk uh, quite a bit more about schistosome hematobium because it's a, 
some of the work we've done is a very good example of the kind of population genomics that you can do. So if you look at the at, at Schistosome hematobium, it's actually one of a group of species here at the bottom, all very, very closely related. Hematobium guineensis are uh, both uh, infect humans and then curacinae and bovis, they affect um, livestock, you know, cattle and then curacinae, uh, sheep and goats as well. So um, less work, of course, also is generally done on schistosoma hematobium, even though it's a major, major issue for particularly in in Africa. Um, it's much more difficult to keep in the lab, keep alive. So so it tends to be the focus of, of less research endeavor simply because it's it's complicated, but it's a, it's it's perfectly easy. In fact, in many ways, easier to collect than just the soma mansoni in the field. So one of the things of interest is is the interaction between these different species. So we can see up the top left there, you can see this graph where uh, this transmission focus in Lum in Cameroon in the uh, in the in the from the nineteen seventies onwards. Um, Probably deforestation, certainly uh, human-induced environmental change caused a favorable environment for Schistosoma hematobium to come on the scene where previously it had been solely Schistosoma guineensis in that particular area. Guineensis has a more restricted uh, geographic distribution than, than hematobium. And you can see that hematobium basically increased guineensis, went down over time based on those surveys. Uh, so, it, uh, in, and in the end, hematobium seems to have replaced guineensis. Um, again, Bonnie Webster uh, did her, her thesis actually on, on this kind of work. And so, in this paper, she showed that um, hematobium and guineensis by comparing mitochondrial genes and, uh, and nuclear genes, just a couple of markers of each, that it looks like that they were actually hybridizing together. Now, those samples that were collected way back then, we kept in liquid nitrogen, so they're available for uh, analysis when uh, uh, later on. And so that's another really good reason for hanging on to material. So if we uh, look at the, the, the so the, this paper has been published recently, Landy U et al. Uh, 2022. 20, uh, and you can see that schistosoma hematobium from Mali and Nigeria on the right here, this is an admixture analysis. So what we're looking at, each of those bars represents the genome of a single sample. And, and what the admixture analysis does is it groups together samples where it thinks that the, uh, the, the ancestry of the alleles are from the same population. So we can see that in Mali and Nigeria, it looks like schistosoma hematobium is more or less yellow, although there are a few little red bits that suggest it's similar to schistosoma bovis. That's a different species, of course, which is in Senegal, but we've got generally good uh, separation there. And we'll come back to that maybe in a bit. And then the island populations of guineensis on Sao Tome that have not been exposed to hematobium are all blue, but we can see that uh, in Cameroon. Um, we've got a mix of, uh, of, of heritage from both um, schistosoma hematobium and schistosoma guineensis, even as late as 1998, with you know quite a big proportion of the genome. So the fact that we're getting sort of you know 50, 50, 80, 20, 25, 75, that kind of mix, that indicates that that is a very current and ongoing um, um, hybridization between these species and one hasn't uh, and it hasn't gone to completion yet so as predicted that's what we found uh, more recently uh, Duncan Berger has done this with some samples we provided some of those samples and and also John Webster was working in Senegal and did some more samples showing contemporary hybridization between the two um, uh, livestock species uh, Curacao and Gideensis essentially doing the same thing but in more detail so that's another interesting paper and then finally you know the same sort of analysis that we can do with these so we provided the samples again for uh, for, for this study um, so again we've got that admixture um, analysis on the left there and you can see this time that schistosoma hematobium from Zanzibar is all of you know you can see that you've got quite a, a large sample set there and they're all showing more or less blue 
Um, so that's that contrasts with Schistosoma hematobium from Niger, which are, are more or less separate. They just share a, you know, a few alleles there. But also Schistosoma hematobium from Niger, you can see that it shares some Schistosoma bovis um, alleles. And those are those little uh, green ones at the top. So is that real? Is it just coincidence that they happen to be the same? No, it is the re uh, result of hybridization, but it's probably an ancient hybridization that has almost gone to completion. Because again, we do see this contrast between um, uh, between different mitochondrial and, and nuclear genes. It's very difficult using that technique alone to work out, you know, how you know when that happened, whether it's contemporary, whether it's old. But what's particularly interesting in this case is that because this it looks like the hematobium in some uh, time in the past there's been a hybridization bet between the two species. Um, there's been you know back crossing, back crossing, back crossing, so that essentially the hematobium has replaced any of the uh, any of the bovis genes. But we've there are some of these gene alleles, some of them are persisting in the population. They're not evenly distributed. You can see on the right here is, is the schistosoma bovis allele frequency, chromosome by chromosome. Some areas, they're more persistent than others. And then you can go through and you can do, these are two measures of selection. And we can see that this particular region here seems to uh, provide a strong um, selective advantage on, on these particular uh, individuals and that uh, that's actually a gene called invader lysin that is involved in host penetration so we're actually getting you know by by taking this kind of population uh, genomics approach we're actually learning a little bit about the function of, of, of what's going on in the in the parasite um, we can also, or, or we've, 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 we've also provided samples. Um, so that previous paper in this one, this is Tim Anderson in, in Texas, his group that's been working on this. So looking at drug resistance, and of course that's very, very relevant for, uh, for operational research, for, for treating schistosomiasis. Oxamnoquin itself, of course, is a drug that, uh, that isn't so relevant. It's not used to treat uh, schistosomiasis these days. In fact, it's only ever been used in, in South America. Uh, but what this study showed by um, screening through looking for uh, res uh, oxamnoquin resistance genes, those genes um, are present in South America, but they're also present in um, uh, in Africa where oxamnoquin has never even been used. So, so it, it was never a case of, uh, of oxamnoquin uh, requiring you know that, you know that resistance to evolve. There were already resistant individuals within the population that then uh, using that drug was just selecting for. So that's why oxamnoquin resistance occurred very rapidly indeed. And now these studies are moving on to look at Prezaquantel itself because uh, Prezaquantel, uh, these two papers uh, just came out quite recently, um, taking different approaches really to investigate uh, what's going on with with Prezaquantel, its mode of action, because um, you know that's been sort of conjectural for some time, but now we've got a ve very firm target for um, how Prezaquantel works, and so we can start to look for um, we can start to screen for, uh, for resistance in the same way, and so using essentially the same sample set and the same data set, Tim Anderson's group looked for uh, Prezaquantel resistance markers within uh, population within uh, you know the, the samples that we'd found and uh, strikingly he only from the entire set so we provided the the African ones in that in, in that previous study he, he also merged them with a, a, a set from Oman and uh, and Brazil that we didn't provide here he was using essentially the same set he only found one potential uh, resistance uh, resistant allele um, that from Amman, that was heterozygous, and that resistance allele would have rendered that uh, that gene non-functional. So it probably could only work as a, as a heterozygous individual. Um, so at the moment, it looks like we don't have too much to worry about with Prezaquantel resistance. But now, having done that initial work, they're going back and doing much larger studies, uh, sampling in different ways so that they can combine very large amounts of, of, of samples 
uh, by combining them, which is, is less useful for general use, but good if you want to find a needle in a haystack, just to look at, at, uh, at, at what's going on. So, so that's another way that, you know, having this initial uh, sample set and then you, you, you can do some initial work and then you can follow that up with, with new studies and, and collect things in the way that you want to. Um, and that's really the point. You know, these kinds of collections can act as the starting point and an excellent initiator and catalyst for research programs. Um, I hope that they encourage people into the field by providing material that they wouldn't you know, easily have access to or don't know how to collect. And then we can transfer the skills uh, back to the people you know, by linking back to uh, the people working you know, at the coalface very much in the field. Um, you can see that, and this is just a big th shout out and thank you to lots of the various people that we've worked to in various capacities. As I say, we have over the years worked with a lot of people, so apologies if uh, we've worked together and I've missed you off. And that's me done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aidan, uh, for this fascinating presentation on the role uh, and the nature of biobanks in improving uh, schistosomiasis understanding, but also very concrete uh, applications into the control. Uh, and also into showing us with those wonderful videos uh, how samples were collected, prepared, stored. Um, and it's been really interesting starting off with um, kind of this look into biobanks beyond um, human samples and data, which tend to uh, be the focus when it comes to, um, to health and disease, but of course will be crucial um, in terms of parasitic and vector-borne diseases, uh, many of which are listed in the NTD. So thank you very, very much. And um, obviously you're, we'll come back to that in the discussion, but um, very much open to collaboration. So if anyone <clears throat> does uh, wish to find out more about the collections, we, uh, we can discuss that um, in a few moments. Uh, but before that, we're going to broaden the lens slightly and hand over to Warren Franzman and Dr. Sarah Nogaro um, from FIND, which you could say is one of the world's most famous and successful PDPs for the development of diagnostics for poverty-related diseases. And uh, Warren, you're, you're on screen now, thank you. And you'll speak to us in a bit more detail about the development of a virtual biobank, the TS Connect. So without any further delay, um, I hand over to you and thank you again. Thank you, I am audio, audible? Yes, absolutely. Great, thank you very much. Uh, uh, big thank you to, to the organizers of this webinar. Uh, thank you for inviting us. Of course, uh, I'm from FIND and I lead the biobanking activities at FIND. Um, FIND is, of course, a global not-for-profit organization with our headquarters in Switzerland and with various in-country offices. Um, I, myself, am based in Cape Town. Uh, and of course, FIND connects countries and communities. We connect funders, decision makers, healthcare providers, and test developers um, as we seek to ensure equitable access to reliable diagnostics around the world. Um, so once again, um, I'm Warren and I will be unpacking a little bit, you know, FINE's perspective on biobanking. And um, please uh, think, think of, you know, a couple of questions um, for us to really unpack and, um, you know, um, get into the subject. So before I describe exactly, you know, how FIND sees biobanking, let's just get into a few definitions. So if, if you're a researcher, uh, you know, at an academic institution and you, or maybe just a researcher at a, at a national, national re reference um, outfit uh, doing di diagnostics, uh, you inevitably have secondary samples that you keep um, and you're hoping to use it at some stage again for research. Um, that we call a collection of samples. Um, it may have a common theme, but if you are collecting and hoping to use it for, you know, in the distant future and you're storing for several decades, not distributing those samples uh, in any way 
uh, you unfortunately only have a collection of samples. Um, you only go to the next stage, which is called biobanking, when you are your primary activity, in fact, involves the distribution, uh, making those samples accessible to the wider um, research community. Uh, and our colleague Aiden has, 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 has touched a lot on uh, you know, access to samples uh, and, and very, um, very well done on, on the presentation, Aiden. It was uh, very, um, I mean, I love the video footage. Unfortunately, uh, my presentation does not have all of uh, the glitz and glamour, but thank you very much. It was very informative. So. So, 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 you know, when you have, um, when you are tracking your samples as a biobank, uh, meaning you have a limbs biobanking, does not matter what it's called, but it's, you know, you know exactly, you know, where the samples are stored in a freezer. By looking at a database, you go down to aliquot level, exactly knowing where, in which um, freezer, in which um, shelf, in which rack, in which box um, that sample is. Um, and you're distributing those samples and, you know, forging collaborations, um, you know, to, to, um, to deepen research outputs, you may call yourself a biobank. Uh, of course, the um, quality, um, you know, becomes, the quality standards becomes very much stringent as you go down the arrow, uh, where you have certified biobanks. You know, there's 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 well organized processes in place. You've got a well organized QMS, and there's consistencies across the collection, the uh, processing, the storage, the quality control, and then finally distribution, uh, distributing those samples um, to fellow researchers. Um, there's also the the ISO um, standard 2387, uh, almost five years old now. Um, for you know accredited biobanks, and you know this is a you know here here we have a variety of of, of factors that play a role. There may be a proficiency program that you participate um, in, and you may have well organized. We in the biobanking field we call it you know well curated, well characterized biospecimen. And you can even produce a certificate of production, um, you know, as such. Uh, of course, reference material. We hear uh, all the time, you know, that that folks, that manufacturers are always looking for um, reference material. Um, you know, and you know, if if you are at that stage where you produce these panels. Um, and you are able to, in fact, issue a certificate of analysis um, for traceability and for reproduci reproducibility, then you are definitely, you know, along um, the lines of a what we call a reference material producer and, of course, a certified biobank. So, right. So in this slide, I will be focusing um, really on the three pillars that define biobank operations are, um, are based on. And I want to focus uh, for uh, just a short while on the find centralized biobank. If you would see it on the left-hand side uh, with a black dot. Um, and here really we have stored more than 500,000 well-characterized, um, you know, what we perceive as fit for purpose um, um, samples with associated, you know, metadata. So, you know, it's a centralized approach to biobanking. It's currently stored with our partner in the U.S. And these are disease-specific collections. So they range across the fine disease spectrums. And here we have a robust governance, um, you know, in terms of how the samples were collected, um, stored, and then eventually distributed. We also have a, a, a process in place for a sample access. Um, I'm going to touch briefly, briefly on that in terms of we've got a, a specimen bank review committee. Requests come to us via our website. And um, we've got the material request form, material transfer agreement that needs to be executed by both file and the requester because it's a legal document. 
So, you know, whenever you move samples around, it, it always becomes a legal um, a matter. And, you know, requesters then submit the reasons for, for them requesting a batch of samples from us. We've got a committee that um, evaluates these requests. And, you know, these need to be um, in, in line with FINE's organizational goals. Uh, we evaluate the, the new technology that, uh, that the requester wants to develop. And, you know, there's a, a couple of criteria that needs to be before we say yes we are going to you know um, provide those samples to you and ship it to you um, so that is the one 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 tier of our of our operations and we receive you know more than 100 requests per year and um, we we then fulfill those requests following a procedure that um, you know just in terms of compliance, um, but the um, the really exciting point for us is um, we've recently developed a dashboard where a requester are, is able to go, you know, onto onto the dashboard and you know per collection per disease actually view exactly what we have in our freezes um, at aliquot level. Um, it's you know it's 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 been a long journey for us developing this dashboard, but we really we really th you know, believe that it will um, not only, you know, make the the request procedure and process more user friendly, but it will definitely um, increase the number of samples we distribute. Um, and as I said, for find, you know, distribution of those samples, making sure the samples are being used um, is one of the most important um, KPIs that we have. Then secondly, um, I want to um, focus your attention on the, tour, the, sorry, the turquoise color dots in various countries. This is what we call the fine integrated biobanking model, and it's a, it's a disease agnostic model. It's a decentralized approach to, to biobanking. And, you know, here we really work with um, with partners in country and demi countries and we come alongside them we really partner with them in collecting fit for purpose samples um, and then what you know a further step to that is we often you know ship our test kits for verification for optimization validation to the sites where the um, you know the, the competent lab team in country then test these um, test um, test kits or diagnostic kits um, and provide provide the um, you know the data to the various manu manufacturers. Uh, we really believe that you know this is you know this is this is our our model where we can respond with with reasonable agility you know in the face of a new pandemic or new variant of concern where where you know setting up a trial um, you know invariably takes you 18 months if you consider procurement you know, IRB approval um, training um, and you know all the all the rest for, for you to to set up a collection and have um, samples available in the freezer so so from a biobanking perspective it's it's all about timing right when the need arise for a sample set um, many times we often face with a, a you know a delay in in having the samples available in the freezer and and this is this is something that we at find one to and um, you know many other organizations out there that we partner with we will be able to respond with complete agility in the face of a new variant um, of course um, when you when you um, request a sample from any one of these countries that we have partnered with, you are confident uh, in the fact that um, those, that sample, whether it's from South Africa, Nigeria, Moldova, Peru, uh, Ghana, wherever we've got our, our, our sites set up, that sample was collected. It was processed, it was um, quality controlled, stored, and is distributed following exactly the same um, standard operating procedure uh, and and that just gives you confidence in in, in the quality of the sample um, but we we can unpack that even you know during the the, the, the discussions our very last um, 
the last thing that I want to concentrate on is the DX Connect Virtual Biobank. Um, this is, of course, an online platform where we as fine is saying, you know, if the visibility of samples have ever been a, an issue uh, or a, a stumbling block or hindrance for the advancement of test development, then no longer should it be the, the case. We now have a, an open access platform where we invite um, researchers from, from, from all spheres to register their collections on our on our um, on the platform and we make those collections um, available right to, to researchers uh, to, to manufacturers um, our our initial scope of this project was focused on NTDs um, but we are also um, thinking about you know broadening the scope so um, basically fine's role in this instance is to connect the the, the sample owner with the sample user um, and of course um, you know the discussions around IP and MTAs that takes place um, between the two um, parties request and owner of the sample but effectively find does the connecting part and make these samples visible uh, to even needs them. Um, I mean, I think it's it's uh, for us as researchers, we need to be ethically responsible um, in ensuring that when we collect samples from um, participants and patients um, for the purpose of, um, you know, to use it downstream, that we go at length to make those connections and to forge those collaborate. Um, co collaborating um, 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 uh, instances. Great. So, just as a reminder, we hold you know sample sets across the um, the uh, disease portfolio within Find, um, and as you can see, the number there it's 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 well over five hundred thousand, and this constitutes both a central repository in the US and our find integrated biobanks, um, you know, across the sites uh, in the countries where we have them set up. Uh, very important here is, you know, we often um, get requests for specific sample types. Um, and then, you know, we, you know, our research teams, we go through a lot of, um, you know, planning and, 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 and effort to make sure that we've got the, you know, the sample type needed by um, users and that our samples um, have this, you know, enough characterization for those samples to, you know, to have increased value um, because, you know, a sample without um, characterization or clinical data, it, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much um, useless and we, you know, we figure out, you know, if, if if you are going to do this, you might as well do it right. And um, we um, we then obviously, you know, go through a lot of effort to to make characterization available with our fit for purpose samples downstream. Uh, just a snapshot of what we have available in our find integrated biobank network of sites. Um, more than 100,000 aliquots of very, um, you know, high quality, well curated um, COVID samples. And we make, in fact, these samples um, available, you know, without charging any handling fees. So we don't recoup any costs. Um, and all we ask is, you know, um, that the requesters send us back the results of, of you know, the assay where the, the samples were being used because we're a donor funded organization and we we need to support back as to how our our resources were were spent um, currently we are doing a, a monkeypox sample with a, a partner in the drc um, and we already have three or uh, four in fact tests kits that we are planning to ship to the to the lab uh, for evaluation of of these of these test kits. Great. And then I'm going going to stop with the DX Connect Virtual Biobank. And I really, really want to emphasize the fact that, you know, um, sample visibility through this platform is, is increased. Um, and we want to stimulate those meaningful collaborations where, where we know that, you know, the samples that we've collected 
um, that it actually gets used for the purpose that you know it was collected in the first place. Um, the the um, the project was originally um, funded by by Gates and Unitaid, and we facilitate access to samples by way of this this platform. So I invite you on the score. Um, I invite you to to share the link of our, our DX Connect virtual biobank platform with your network, with your researching partners. Um, you know, number one, we, we want to have, you know, fit for purpose collections registered on our platform. Number two, make those collections visible to anyone and everyone who needs it. Yeah, just a reiteration of, um, you know, the the um, the purpose behind this platform is we really want to maximize the use of existing resources. There's no no use of you know setting up a new collection if those samples are in fact available with with within a network. Reduce duplication. I mean, there's there's no reason for for, for all of us to, to be doing the same thing. Uh, let's share the valuable resources, and in that way we can increase if, um, efficiency in in our research. Um, outputs um, and I think that is it I'm going to give it over now to my colleague Sarah and I'm um, looking forward to your, to your questions at the end of her session cheerio thanks Warren and I hope you can hear me great uh, thank you so I'm just conscious of time and I'd love to leave some time for us to answer some of your questions so let me just hone in on one specific example of um, the need for these samples so why do we need samples really if you look at the diagnostic development pipeline there's really five different phases all the way from concept to having a final product and for each of these phases you'll need specific samples for which the number of samples and the volume required per sample is different. So for example, in the concept phase, when you're looking at biomarker discovery, you want a diversity of different um, samples. If you move along to once you've validated your biomarker and you move into feasibility and development, again, you'd love to have a different set of samples um, for that use case. Phase three, which is around verification and validation. So that's once your product has been designed, locked and transferred to manufacturing. And now you're trying to validate um, the product, a design lock product after manufacturing. Again, you'd love to have different um, samples for those. Use case four, which would be really under phase four, that's looking at quality assurance and, and doing, um, again, uh, different samples and, and requirements of samples. And then finally, um, you have a different use case for phase five when you're trying to really look at the difference in performance between different tests. And so there again, you'd love to have some well characterized samples that can be used um, as you test different devices side by side. So really, the key message from this slide is that you want the number of samples and the volume required per sample to be different uh, for each of these use cases. So I'm now going to hone in on one specific example of um, uh, establishing a platform for uh, development of new diagnostic tests for Shisto with our experience that we had in Kenya uh, with our partner, Kemri, uh, back in 2019. So what we were doing was to collect samples from three different sites, um, two sites that were non uh, one site that was non-endemic for Shisto and two sites that were endemic for Shisto. And we enrolled anybody who was five years old and above. And as you can see from this diagram, we collected stool and urine samples for those individuals on three consecutive days. And on day one, we also collected a venous blood. In, uh, in each site, 156 individuals were enrolled. So in total, just less than 500 samples were, were obtained or from patients, uh, samples were obtained. And at the end of the study, once the results uh, using either um, CATA cats or urine filtration to ensure if individuals were infected for Shisto uh, or also for soil transmitted helminths using the stool samples, then uh, we treated individuals or the Ministry of Health treated individuals or offered treatment um, at the end of the study. 
So just briefly, uh, we have, uh, those were the sites that were selected. So we've got uh, Kimende in Kiabu, which was our non-endemic site. And then in Western Kenya, we had the site of Siaya with, uh, that is specific for Mansonai infections with a, quite a high prevalence of uh, Schisto infection. And on the east, uh, to Taita Taveta, uh, it was our endemic site for hematobium with a prevalence of 25%. And that was based on um, mapping available from the countries. And so really what we, so what I'm showing here is a, a diagram of the sample flow on your day one. So once the individuals had been consented uh, and they were enrolled in the in the study, we obtained some demographic and clinical data from those individuals. And then we collected uh, a stool sample, a venous blood and a urine sample. Now for each of those sample types, we did different activities. So if we start on the left under stool, we did some cater cat. Um, so that was on two slides um, on day one. Then we aliquoted some stool sample that was going to be used for PCR testing later on, as well as for long-term storage. And then for a subset of these individuals, we also wanted to look at um, the performance of health Mentex, which was developed by a group in, in South America, but actually had never been uh, tested on the African continent. And therefore we wanted to look at the performance of, of Helmand Tex as well, more as an exploratory work. For venous blood, so five mils of uh, venous blood was collected. Uh, back at the lab uh, at the site, we um, aliquoted some plasma samples and that were going to be stored and then also some dried blood spots for each individual. And finally for urine, urine filtration was was done there was also data on hemostics there was some uh, urine aliquots that were going to be stored for pcr testing later on as well as some aliquots that were reserved for long-term storage and then on day three and day two and day three uh, so at this point we we're just looking at stool and urine so we didn't collect blood on day two and day three and again the samples for stool were characterized for um, by cater cats, uh, as well as a subset of individuals uh, had Helmentex data as well. And then also we had some um, aliquots of stool for day two and day three. And then likewise for urine, there was urine filtration that was done on both days. And then again, some aliquot left over for long-term storage. And now if we move back to the when all the when the study was completed in the field, the samples were shipped back to the, uh, the Kemri Center in Nairobi. And then um, for stool, blood and urine, um, the aliquots for long term storage were entered into the biobank. That's a, a fantastic biobank at Kemri. Um, there was also some, so the Helmentex was performed and there is some uh, aliquots to do PCR, but for which we don't um, have funding for right now. But basically what we get from all of these samples is that we know for each individual, the age of the individual, the sex of the individual, the volume of blood that was collected, the volume of filtered urine that was used, and we also have temperature for long-term storage for all of the samples. And then for each of the sample types listed in this table, so blood, stool, and urine, and for stool, stool and urine, we've got information on all of these that are mentioned here for all of the visits. So uh, visit one, visit two, and visit three. So quickly, if we look for blood, we know the number of dried blood spots that was collected for each individual, the number of plasma aliquots, and also the volume per aliquot that's available. Stool, there is, we know information about if there was visible presence of blood in stool. We know the status um, and egg number of schisto infection as well as for STHs infections. And for a subset of these samples, we've got also information on Helmentex. And then we've also got uh, stool aliquots for further um, use if required. And likewise for urine, we've got information around visible hematuria. Again, status and egg number for schisto infections, the number of urine aliquots that's available and the volume for each of these aliquots which is stored. So it's quite a really rich uh, sample set that we that we have with with Camry. 
So my last slide is really, or my before last slide is really, what were the lessons learned from this work? And, you know, the first thing um, is that you really need a research question, especially if you're going to go with a, a research institute and you partner with the research institute in the country. Uh, and in terms of, you know, with ethical review boards, etc., you can't just collect samples for the sake of collecting samples, but there needs to be a research question associated with it. And here, our research question was to, to look at the performance of Helmintex. The lesson learned as well the second one is really about that um collecting prospective collections so what we did with kemri is actually really time consuming um, and takes quite a lot of effort to collect all of this data um, and characterize these samples but it brings me to the next point of the characterization of samples um in that the need for comprehensive characterization on how and what information is collected affects the usability of these samples. So it's really key that um, all of the information is collected and then well stored. But that also means that you need to think ahead in two, two ways. The first one is obviously it takes time to set up these studies. And so um, you need to give yourself enough time so that when you actually need these samples, you have these samples. But the second thing is that you need to think ahead in terms of how you study, you know, what is your study design looking like? Um, because it's, and you, so you plan for what you need because changing anything retrospectively um, has a huge impact and sometimes it's just, it's just not possible. Hopefully uh, through what I've presented briefly, you see um, how valuable these samples could be for any test developer or manufacturer that needs samples to either optimize, develop or optimize or validate date their test. Um, so it's really important that for collection holders, um, such as Kemri and, and others, uh, probably perhaps on this call, that it's important to bring visibility to your collections because a lot of time and effort and, and funding has gone into this to have access to these samples and um, that are so rich and, and well characterized and can be hugely um, helpful and, and fast track developments of, of diagnostic tests. Um, so really, I just want to emphasize this uh, last slide, uh, which what Warren had presented before, is that, you know, for all the collection holders out there and hopefully on the on the webinar today, um, that you see the value of making your collections uh, visible and we can help you with that by registering your collections uh, on the DX Connect Virtual Biobank and I've seen that Anouk has put these links uh, in the chat, so thank you for that. Um, and FIND can help with that facilitating um, you know, for sample requesters, so developers and manufacturers to have access to these samples and, and being really that link between the sample providers and sample requesters. And I'll, and I'll stop here and, um, and hand over back to Marianne. Thank you. Round of applause and a huge thank you to yourselves, Warren and Sarah and also Aidan for those amazing presentations. Uh, you've really shown us the kind of breadth and depth of challenges around uh, biobanks and samples uh, from the legal to the practical storage, consent, I mean, so many issues, but also very thankfully, lots of solutions and uh, tools, processes and collaborations in, in the works uh, and ongoing to overcome those challenges. And here at ICENTD, we're definitely big fans of the DX Connector platform. In fact, Earlier this year, as part of our um, what we call the ICENTD Festival, which brings together all sorts, all things creative around neglected tropical diseases, whether that be uh, film, apps, gaming, but also uh, portals and interfaces, very creative and innovative approaches such as DX Connect. So all that to say we did give the platform an award, the data award earlier this year in February. So uh, we can't wait to watch this space and we hope that a lot of our attendees and listeners will, will uh, engage as much as possible with the, with the resource. Um, but I suppose kind of thinking about uh, everything we've heard uh, about in the last hour, um, we'd maybe like to start the discussion with just a question on some of the challenges that remain. So we do have this sort of spectrum. On the one hand, the samples and collecting the samples 
then the processing, the storage, but then also uh, highlighting the visibility of those collections and then all the way to potential users. So all along that um, spectrum, where, based on your experience, do you feel either are the biggest uh, gaps at the moment or where would you like to see more effort or conversely where do you feel there's been a lot of um, improvement is is there part of that continuum where you think we should really be focusing efforts at the moment and perhaps to answer that we could go in order of presenters uh, thanks uh, marianne um Great question, and of course the the, the challenges are immense. Uh, I mean, really great to hear what Find has been doing because I think um, you know that offers the solution. I mean, the the problem that we've had, of course, in the end with Scan is that uh, the Wellcome Trust were great in funding us for ten years, uh, but you know having that continuity of funding and um, and, and being able to sustain what you're doing is difficult. I mean, we can we can look after what we've got, um, but we um, we without further funding, it's impossible to expand and do more. So, so it's great to have a combination of distributed networks and um, central resources uh, with some sort of funding model. I mean, I think that's that's the way these things work. Um, it's also um, the the regulatory aspects of of, uh, of of what's going on are huge. Uh, we all want to we, we all want to make best use of samples and be nimble, but of course that can slow you. You know the, the regulation is complex and can slow you down. Uh, so also great to have you know to, to have um, you know that kind of support. I think that's what we need. Uh, we we need. We need to be able to to have resources to draw on that can that can help us, you know, do what we need to do, which is get these samples in and make them available. Thank you, Warren. Yeah, um, there's indeed a lot of challenges, but I'm I think I'm just going to highlight one as a as a biobanker, um, and and we touched on that, you know, available available samples are not necessarily accessible and i mean you can have if you did a survey of you know how many samples are currently stored you know across the world it's it's probably well within the tens of millions uh, a fraction of those collections are accessible for research purposes far too often uh, researchers store samples um, but do not share so i would you know like to appeal to to this group and you know to the networks out there uh, please do the ethical responsible thing and you know and share your samples and forge those collaborative projects over Thanks, and I think I mean I uh, I think I, I completely agree with what Aiden and, and Warren have mentioned. I think for for us, it's about sometimes finding the right balance about storing for the sake of storing, just in case we need them, and that if we missed an opportunity, if we don't. On the other hand, you're then clogging up freezer, um, for which you don't have long term funding for, and very often these legacy collections can no longer be used because of they weren't collected in the right way, etc. So there is really that fine balance between storing because we might need them and doing prospective collection. And, and fine's positioning is more now of let's have an end user in mind or an, a use case in mind and let's collect for that uh, as opposed to what we've done in the past of just collecting and keeping just for the sake of it. And it's, it's really trying to find that fine balance. Um, and then really um, supporting on, on Warren's point about making, you know, sharing your collections because they're hugely valuable. Um, and, you know, having that that information available is, is fantastic. Uh, on our side, we are trying to also improve the user journey experience and um, to register collections. Um, but I think it's something that we could, all of the community could really benefit of as well, making their collection shared. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for those insights and kind of building on this uh, issue of 
um, simplifying processes. Uh, there was a question from Professor David Rollinson. Uh, would anyone like to comment on the impact of the Nagoya Protocol on the movement of NTD samples between countries and building biobanks that can be accessed by all investigators? Um, well, it's and the Nagoya Protocol is a great idea. We all want to make sure that uh, the um, the essentially access and benefit sharing that, that we are uh, that, that we are sharing the benefits uh, we're not taking things illegally and we're we're essentially behaving ethically the problem comes with certainly in our experience the problem comes with compliance it's and, and showing compliance the the procedures vary country by country they can be very slow and sometimes the questions that get asked um, are impossible to answer so so um, at the moment, it, for me, it, it's been a frustrating process, but I think that it's probably maturing and hopefully we will, we will make good pro progress and find ways of, 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 uh, of working more effectively with it. At the moment, I think it's the danger with, uh, Nagoya, with Nagoya is that it will, it, it will inhibit the collaborations. I'm afraid uh, Warren's connection may have dropped off temporarily. So, Sarah, I didn't. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to this. That's more of actually Warren's uh, remit, so I can't step in. But I would agree with what Aidan has has said. Yeah. yeah. No worries. We'll revert back as soon as Warren's back. But I suppose just building on this, there was also a, an interesting question from Carlos Teixeira. Um, who says here, we need to extensively discuss issues with ethical clearance in order to avoid unnecessary requirements for biobank management. For example, I think we would not necessarily need to have a research question. We could have projects aim only on collecting and well characterizing samples for future use. Um, do you agree, disagree? I, we just touched upon that briefly a few seconds ago. Yeah, go ahead, <laughs> um, uh, yeah I, I agreed um, in my experience though the yeah. only way that we can actually uh, it, it's it's unusual to actually have any funding to do collecting without any kind of research question so the question it, it, it I mean it would be great actually I think I mean I've often thought that we concentrate a lot on you know uh, you know uh, our obligations to people as individuals but of course um, if we are um, you know doing mass drug administration for instance uh, perhaps we should be collecting samples so that we you know so we've got a bank of samples and we can look to see if we're selecting for drug resistance that sort of thing uh, and that would would be um, you know I, I, I think that again though it, it would have a specific purpose but of course you would also in that you know generate samples that could be used for other things um, I think it's, it's a question of um, the, you know, the ethical review and the, the, the permission so that the, the, the people donating the sample understand uh, what they are signing up to. It's quite difficult to, um, you know, to leave things completely open ended. I mean, you, that, that's too much to expect, I think. Um, and perhaps just to add on that, I would completely agree with what Aidan was saying. And, and from our experience, you know, we've had to have a research question with the ethics, uh, with the institutes where we did, where we partnered, uh, either be it in Kenya or other countries where we've worked. Um, there has been a target sample uh, profiles, so TSP that have been developed by the DTAG, um, looking at for each uh, or at least certain diseases, what would be for different use cases, the need of these samples and what type of samples we would like to see. Um, but for, to my knowledge, that hasn't been funded to collect samples just to fit that TSP uh, specifically for the use case. And it would have to be through a defined research question that you can then um, collect the samples that you would need. So in my experience, unfortunately, we've had to have a research question to be able to, you know, to collect these samples. Thank you. And Warren, I'm really sorry, I don't know how much of the question you missed, but we've just been discussing um, kind of simplifying the process uh, or improving it 
either by uh, not necessarily having to have a research question and also uh, David Rowlandson um, was asking about the Nagoya protocol and how this might uh, facilitate or enhance um, sharing samples between countries. Thanks, Marianne. You can still hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's weird because I, to me, I was online, but it, it seems like you couldn't see me or hear me. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it was, it, I think it was uh, kind of orchestrated by the universe because the Nagoya protocol and uh, you know discussions around that is is all contentious uh, at, at best. So I'm I'm agreeing in agreement with with Aiden in terms of you know from a biobanking perspective. Uh, for sure, our primary objective would be to um, to facilitate access and benefit sharing, taking into the into into account the Nagoya Protocol um, principles, and um, you know, and, and doing that in a fair way. Um, but at the same time, it has been it it will continue to be frustrating because you know uh, if 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 my main KPI is to to make samples, um, you know. To use samples for uh, for test development, as it is the case we find, um, these frustrations will, will always be there. But it's 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 going to take some more time for us to you know to get to a place where we where where all is smooth. I'm not sure if you agree with me, Aiden, <laughs> but currently it's frustrating. Yeah, I think we've we've got a long way to go. There's no doubt about it, and uh, and really. Uh, kind of the, the 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 old approach, which was more um, uh, you know things held in common and and, and via peer to peer uh, material transfer agreements. Uh, for most of us, that it, I, I I hope that most people would you know uh, would would behave ethically and and for the simple reason that that they want to continue to work together. You know that's a great motivation for people to behave in a reasonable way. And some some of it feels like solving a problem that, that in certainly in my field, and of course this is from my own perspective, which may not chime with 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 others, uh, that that that, it, you, that actually uh, it's solving a problem that that wasn't really wasn't really a problem and and has created a worse problem. <laughs> but but and maybe it, it's it's a highly contentious issue, and I, uh, no. I you know I'm I'm very. Um, conscious of, of, of you know where I am located etc maybe just as a last uh, comment uh, Marianne I you know as part of fine sample access um, we really see to um, you know to drive that access benefit sharing principle where, where we have samples stored at site, there is an equal custodianship or equal control over you know, how the samples are being used. So certainly in that way, we are moving towards what, what is have hoped to achieve by the uh, Nagoya, Nagoya Protocol. Over. We, what we want to avoid is too much, you know, we, we, need, we need to decide what our priorities are. And of course, really the priority is to encourage people to research uh, in neglected tropical diseases, you know, the more people we can get doing that, the less neglected they will be. That, that's that's my perspective. Thank you so much. Uh, that's wonderful. And uh, you're getting a lot of questions from the audience, which are of a uh, more practical nature now. Uh, so first, a question from Bonnie Webster, um, who, of course, uh, is with the Natural History Museum in London as well. Uh, it was mentioned in the presentation. Uh, Bonnie says, Thanks, Warren and Sarah. Um, downstream work on samples is often dependent on how the sample has been stored. For example, frozen, ethanol. Do you provide recommendations on how to store samples for different applications? And also, do you find issues with shipping clinical samples? For example, couriers may not ship samples as they may be infectious in some way. And also, does this link to how they are preserved? <clears throat> any, any tips and recommendations? Thank you. So thanks, Bonnie, for your question. Um, so in terms of recommendation of how samples uh, need to be stored, it, um, you know, with this use case of having a, or with this approach of having a defined use case for these samples, then it's very much discussion 
on with the test developers or the manufacturers on how um, samples should be stored. Um, there is, if there's further testing needed, for example, where the characterization cannot be done in country but need to be shipped to other, um, you know, uh, organizations for uh, further testing, then we'll we'll work with the 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 science scientists in those institutions to ask how the samples they would like to use them for their protocols so that the samples can be can be used and um, so there is no recommendation per se but very much it's a discussion with the whoever is going to receive those samples um, and then if not then it's obviously you know at minus 80 um, for uh, urine and, and plasma samples and and uh, dried blood spots that can either be stored at room temperature um, for, for future use. In terms of uh, couriers, so uh, that's more of a Warren question, but um, Warren uh, supports and his team support the, the, the research teams to help with shipping of, of samples if they need to be shipped. Um, we have obviously our preferred uh, providers to help with um, Shif uh, shipping of of, um, of samples. There's clear documents that are needed prior a simple uh, a sh a shipment can be done, but uh, it's normally quite uh, straightforward, should I say, <laughs> uh, once the paperwork is in place and that these samples can be can be shipped. But I don't know, uh, Warren, would you like to add a bit more on that? Yes, certainly. Uh, thanks. Thanks, that's a great question, and it, I mean, it comes up um, often in biobanking discussions. Um, so we are members of the uh, ISBA, the International Society for Biological and Environmental Repositories, uh, and we share often with, with our, you know, networks the uh, best practices as, as, you know, as released by them. We also have, um, you know, around 65 as part of our QMS, um, work instructions, policies, and forms around, you know, collecting, processing, storing, and distributing those samples. So, so we, I mean, we, we we've got a, a set of documents that that we can share. Um, but certainly, you know, shipping of samples, as Sarah mentioned, um, is is a lot of documentation. Um, you know, export and import permits uh, and MTAs take often, um, you know, uh, a long time to. Uh, to be completed, but uh, many times it is in-country regulations that we need to comply with. Um, like certain countries, you are only allowed to to ship fifty percent um, of the collected collection. Um, it's a it's a national regulation in that country. Um, other countries, uh, I'm not going to name them now. Only ten percent, and you know, for some countries that we've worked with and currently working with, just to um, to apply for an export permit. Um, invariably takes, you know, um, eight to 12 weeks for, you know, a, a simple set of samples just to, you know, to be to, to be exported to a requester. So there's never a dull moment within biobanking because these things always, um, you know, clutter up your day. Over. Um just building on some of the more practical questions that have been coming in. So a couple here from Mariangela Bonizzoni, uh, who's saying thanks for the great presentations uh, regarding the use of biobank samples to understand many aspects of schistosome biology. Uh, Mariangela was wondering, which procedures or documents do you require to submit samples and share them? Is there a pre-formatted MTA, material transfer agreement, uh, but also which infrastructure do you maintain your samples? Or if I can widen that, um, maybe what would be the ideal uh, <laughs> infrastructure or, or processes? Um, so that's to me, I guess. Uh, yeah, thinking yeah. during your presentation. Yeah, um, so yes, and, and of course, um, a lot of our um, uh, a lot of our material that has arisen from you know us basically joining a project. You know that's that's how we that's how we've done it because it's it's far too much to expect people to um, uh, you, you know to donate samples you know and just act as a passive repository. So you know the, the we research agreements and material transfer agreements as part of that. There may 
uh, you know, um, Warren has, has mentioned, you know, export permits. There's a lot of uh, required paperwork. So for us, um, we do have a standard material transfer agreement, but of course, sometimes that is a subject of negotiation. We will do, you know, modify things on a case by case basis. Um, but of course, you know, the, the issue with this is that it all does take uh, a great deal of time and SCAN currently does not have external funding. So, um, you know, our capacity to, you know, to do this at scale now is, is, is limited. Um, but we, we would certainly be very happy to, um, you know, to, to talk and to, uh, and to work out how that we could maintain you know, the biological really, rather than strictly clinical samples in our bank or in, in, in our collection. Um, storage, well, uh, the, uh, idea, the ideal storage is always to freeze instantly, maintain a cold chain and maintain things in liquid nitrogen. I mean, that's the, you know, um, that is the ultimate. In practical terms, we have not done that for some time with, with schistosomes, we're using these FTA cards, and that's entirely a practical decision. It's probably not the ideal storage medium um, for, uh, for for you know super long term storage, but it is extremely efficient in that one. Basically, our entire half a million collection is within a single cabinet. So, in terms of and, and it doesn't have any energy input, we can uh, we keep things dry, ideally uh, vacuum packed you know, to, to reduce, uh, to, to reduce any problem. So, and it's worked very well for us. So, you know, no problem at all. I, I, I quite like the FTA card method. Uh, people are starting to get a bit suspicious of it in terms of, you know, now that um, genome sequencing is going to longer and longer reads, um, we may need to, to take advantage of that. FTA cards may not be the, the the appropriate medium and we might need to put it into some sort of fixative and then freeze it as soon as possible the problem with that is it gets more expensive you know sarah was saying you know the problem with with you know keeping maintaining these things is that they take up space they take up energy and they take up money and uh, so you have to make very careful decisions about what you're going to keep long term so the advantage of a, of a you know a cheap and cheerful method like the fta cards is that uh, is, is that that's not really a problem you can uh you know in in relatively simple um environmentally controlled conditions you can keep them for a reasonable length of time we're still getting good results from stuff that we collected you know in sort of in the 2000s Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah. I don't know if there's any recommendations you'd like to add, uh, not only on schistosomiasis, just perhaps more broadly. Uh, no. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, there's never enough time, especially when you're talking about something like biobanks, but perhaps just to round off our discussions, um, and then we did all agree we try and stay clear of too much controversy or difficult topics, but uh, just still thinking a bit about the main kind of gaps that remain around uh, biobanks. So number one, looking somewhat expanding the pool of samples in terms of genetic material, but also um, moving away from genetic material, also looking at other fields, the omics, for example, and then thirdly, the third gap, which is longitudinal data. Um, sorry, Warren, uh, just to check whether you caught the question or should I just repeat the start of it? I got it. You got it. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry, from my side, you're appearing and disappearing sometimes, So, but that's great. Um, so looking at uh, genetic diversity, the moving to different kind of disciplines and areas, but also longitudinally, three important gaps that remain in biobanking. Where do you kind of feel that the emphasis should be placed? And um, obviously the NTD field and colleagues and organizations in this field certainly can bring a lot to those three aspects. And so just to kind of round everything off and looking at the future, where would you like to see more efforts put in and how can we do that as an NTD community? 
You don't want much there, do you, Mary? Nothing, no. <laughs> <laughs> and thir in 30 seconds, please. <laughs> uh, um, I think um, uh, one possible, I'd, I'd like to see us moving towards genomic surveillance a little bit. You know, uh, it's it's my particular thing, so that, 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 that would be, it would be great to go longitudinally. I think in practical terms, if you're going to do that, you've got to pick your sites, you've got to decide where you're going to do it, and you've got then you've got to stick with it. Um, and so, and it would be great if that was done, um, you know, if, if that was a very much focused, you know, from within the endemic countries. Yeah, so for me, it, it's probably going to be um, finding a way to make uh, biobanking um, more sustainable. Um, I mean, uh, unfortunately, no one gets into biobanking to get rich, but if we can find a way as a community to, you know, to just recoup, recoup some of the costs because this is truly a, a valuable resource and, you know, finding an op operating model that's more sustainable, that would be my ideal. Over. And I guess just to add on, um, I think longitudinal data is extremely important as well. Um, but I think for, for me, it's really about making sure that we bring visibility to the collections that we have and make use of those. And we could actually really push diagnostics forward if I put on my diagnostic hat um, and accelerate efforts if we've got access to these well characterized samples um, already available. It would really speed things along. So really bring visibility to collections would be would be my my ask. That's wonderful. Some really great recommendations uh, that would all quite um, understandably snowball kind of the development of diagnostics and many aspects of tropical diseases. So thank you so much. We've talked to, uh, about everything from the samples and the storage uh, funding, but also ethical considerations, legal implications. There's just been a lot and we're really grateful for to you and, and your time. Thank you so much as well to our attendees and the great questions. There are some that we haven't had a chance to, to touch on yet, but um, we would be more than happy to pass those questions on to the speakers. Perhaps uh, they can be answered uh, individually as time is running out. Uh, thank you to those who tuned in. Professor Chum Chuente, thank you. Professor Najib Harandi, Roseli Tuan, Benjamin Lopez Jimena, lots of colleagues and familiar names. So thank you so much. Um, Warren, to conclude, I will steal your sentence. You told us earlier on that there is never a dull moment in biobanking, and I can believe that. And we hope uh, to have you all on board very soon again to hear um, about uh, developments. And the main message all around is definitely get involved reach out to access those samples. And if you do have them, uh, do come forward to maximize the visibility. So before we conclude the webinar, also a final very big thank you to our colleagues at the Global Schistosomiasis Alliance and particularly Anouk. I hope everyone's had a chance to go on the chat because there's been a lot of really valuable resources and links uh, placed there. And if anyone wants to revisit some of um, the things we've discussed today, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, so on that note, I would just like to say one very big last thank you and goodbye to everyone until our next session. Uh, Carlos Tessera said, excellent meeting. Cheers. I totally agree. And uh, I'm wishing everyone all the best uh, until we connect again. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. All the best, everyone. Bye. Bye.